let's look at the issue of domestic violence globally. You know, it's, it's a universal problem. It's a universal challenge, not limited to Nigeria. But I would like you to talk about the Nigerian space in recent times. What has been the development when it comes to the issue of domestic violence in Nigeria? What has been the trend? What has been the statistics? And then what's your take on the fact that more men have been abused in a place like Lagos State, according to the statistics? Well, uh, thank you for having me once again. I think first it is important to differentiate between what is being reported and the number of people of men being abused. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that more men are coming forward to speak about being abused uh, does not change the the reality on ground, which is the fact that the most endangered people when it comes to domestic violence are women and children. Statistic has it that one in every four women faces the threat of you know domestic violence, you know, while relating with a with a with a uh, with a partner, you know, with an intimate partner. Now, statistic has it that one in every six child, one in every 10 children, you know, suffer from, you know, violence at home. And so when you look at that, you now compare that to what we are finding in Lagos State. I think what is happening in Lagos State should be attributed to the efforts by domestic and sexual violence response agency of the Lagos State government, which has taken the bull by the horn by creating awareness. I think that awareness to know that you don't have to be ashamed if for whatever reason, you are being, you know, abused in your marriage, or you are being abused by a partner. I think uh, our men have been able to do away, particularly in Lagos State, with the whole idea or the shame that accompanies, you know, reporting that they are being abused by their spouse or by their intimate partner. I think that's why we see a surge in the reporting. I think if we look at it nitty gritty, the fact still remains that the most endangered people, when it comes to domestic violence is women and children. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Tariwa Akinlemi for joining us on L Exchange. Now, looking at um, domestic abuse or domestic violence, what could you say could be sometimes the causes of uh, issues around domestic violence? Well, I, I think that um, violence is taught from childhood. Childhood is the foundation of every human being. Maria Montessori says the child is the father of a man. So um, people learn violence from childhood and um, they grow up, you know, seeing, you know, uh, violence in their homes, violence in their environment, violence in their nation. And so at the end of the day, they grow up, uh, their socialization has every element of violence in it. And so because of that, you find a situation where people do not know how else to resolve a matter except through violence, by reason of their upbringing, by reason of their socialization. So because of that, you find that um, so the root cause is childhood. The root cause is the family setting. The root cause is the home that children come from. The root cause is the society that make today's adult. The root cause is the fact that we are dealing with a situation where uh, people will end up as they were raised. So today, we find a lot of violence in our in homes. You find a lot of violence in families because the upbringing of the people who are family women today, who are family men today, was rooted in violence. And so because of that, I think it's from childhood. The problem begins from childhood. And it is important, you know, that we address it because that's why we are saying that enlightenment is superior to enforcement. We say in our organization that our nation does not have national problem. We don't have domestic problem. We don't have educational problem. We don't have um, national problem. We don't have marriage problem. We are dealing with only one problem, mismanaged childhood, manifesting in dysfunctional adulthood. That is the problem we are dealing with. And until we go back to the basis, because you see, there's a factory that produces the violent men. There's a, there's a factory that produces the violent women. It is, it is going to be a, a waste of effort to focus on this, uh, to, to focus on this 
uh, on the product, which is the violent man and the violent man or the woman or the man who perpetrates violence and refuse to visit the factory. All we need to do is to shut down the factory. When we shut down the factory, we we'll realize that the product you know, will cease to come forward. All right, now let's dwell lightly on the impact of domestic violence on the children, you know, because uh, you are from your background, you are a child rights activist. I'd like you to talk about this aspect, the impact of domestic violence on children, on even the family setting, and at large, the society. Well, I, I think that um, violence redirects the child. Violence messes up the mind of the child. So there are four ways by which a child can be abused. One of it, the, the, the fifth one that is hardly spoken about, is that a child witnessing violence at home. A child witnessing violence at home. You know, the home is supposed to be a place where children are supposed to feel safe most. Now, when you are at home and you don't feel safe, then you, you begin to do what we call siege mentality. Now, that not feeling safe is because of what is happening around you. It's because of the violence that is perpetrated by living partners, intimate partners, or spouses, and all of that. Now, growing up, I grew up in a very violent environment. I grew up seeing my father pounded my mother, you know, so many times. I saw my mother also responding, you know, to that, to that, to that treatment. You know, my mother was not the kind of woman that you were going to beat, and she was just going to fold her arms and do nothing. Uh, my father could be sure that if he raised his hand, which he did many times, my mother was going to respond, you know, accordingly. And so I grew up under in, in, in that environment. I also myself, I was physically abused. You know, my, my, when my father wanted to kill me, my father would tie my legs, he would tie my hands, he would strip me naked, he would give me scissors of the cane and he would go and sit down. And that could go on for half a day. And we lived in Adoikiti, you know, face me, I face your apartment where everybody minded their business except gossip. So I grew up, you know, um, I grew up, you know, seeing violence. I grew up, you know, violence being meted out against me. And so I, I grew up thinking that the whole arrangement about marriage is about, you know, getting married to someone. And if the person does what you do not like, you end up, you know, beating up the person. You end up, you know, taking your pound of flesh uh, until I began to have a new orientation and a new thinking in 1997 when I became a follower of Christ. And the truth of the matter is that I don't think I will have been able to do the things that I'm doing today except the fact that there was an intervention. I will have just become another man who beats up his wife, who beats up his children, who messes up, you know, who transfer to the next generation that violence that my parents invested in me. And that's how this thing works. You know, look at people like Hitler. Hitler was an abused child. What did he do? He became an adult. The violence that the parents meted out to him, he transferred it to 62 million people. That was the number of people that the Second World War killed. Uh, you look at people like Joseph Stalin. They were abused, messed up, beaten violently. The, the, the father of Joseph Stalin did not only abuse Joseph, did not only beat up Joseph Stalin, also beat up the mother. One story has it that Joseph Stalin was beaten to a point that at a point he was urinating blood. That's how bad the violence he suffered. He became an adult to, to say he was leading the revolution. You know how many people that he killed and that died through that process. So what, what happens is that the impact of violence against children is eternal except there's divine intervention. And that is why we, we make effort in our organization to ensure that we educate. We educate parents. We educate children. We help them understand the impact of their actions, the things that they do or they omit to do, the impact of that on their children and how that schedules, what they do in terms of perpetrating violence against their children, schedules a moment of pain for people of the future in the lives of those children. All right, you just uh, painted a picture of well, what children go through in the home, not just when their parents abuse each other or one partner abuses the other, but even when the children are the sufferers of the abuse from the parents. But we live in a society where it is believed that until you enforce physical punishment, you can't correct a child, you can't ensure proper upbringing. So why do we draw the line between ensuring proper upbringing and not going into physical violence? For children as parents? Well, for me, um, 
I don't believe in physical violence. I don't I don't even believe in this concept you call child discipline. I don't believe in it. Uh so child discipline, child discipline to the extent that it is only the child that needs discipline in the family. It's not only the child that needs discipline in the family. If we accept that nobody is perfect in the family, daddy is not perfect, mommy is not perfect. It therefore means in the family we should be talking about the culture of discipline, not child discipline. Because the way we present it these days, a weak father, a weak mother, a weak guardian who has legions of issues, who cannot control his or her own anger, who cannot control, who, who cannot deal with anger management, is meeting out our weaknesses, his weaknesses, his or her anger on the child. And what is expected is that that is called discipline. That cannot be discipline. So for me, the fundamental thing we first need to establish is that our children are either beneficiaries or, or, or victims of our example. Whatever we see our children do, we are the one who put those things there by our examples. So therefore, what we must be concerned about as parents, first of all, is the example we show to our children. Now, that example informs what our children do. So this is what happens. We raise our children in a particular way. We show all kinds of examples that are negative. These children follow the example. All of a sudden, we want to discipline them. All of a sudden, we want to put them right. Meanwhile, now, meanwhile, it is important to note that the mental infrastructure of a child is formed between a zero and six mental infrastructure. That is, the land chalk of the personality of the child is formed between a zero and six. Now, research has said that, science has told us that. Do you know that this age zero and six is what Maria Montessori called the formative years? The formative years. Children at that time have absorbent mind. Do you know that this first six years of the life of the child is what, how, how do children receive instructions in these first six years? Children receive instructions in these first six years, not by beating, not by teaching. How much can you teach a two-year-old? How much can you teach a three-year-old? How much can you teach a five-year-old? How much can you teach a six-year-old? Children at that level, at that absorbent mind, at those formative years, they receive instructions by observation by the examples that their parents show to them. That's how they receive instruction. That is why when a German child is going to speak, the German child is going to speak German. Nobody sits down and teach him. When a Nigerian child is going to speak, well, we, we have been ignorant, we've been English, english -lized, you know, if there's any word like that. So when a Nigerian child is going to speak, he's going to speak English anyway. But when a German man is going to, boy is going to speak, he's going to speak German. When a French boy is going to speak, he's going to be, speak French. When a Japanese child is going to speak, he's going to speak Japanese. When an English boy is going to speak, he's going to speak English. Now, who taught the English man English? English boy English? Nobody, by observation. It would be foolhardy for us to think that the only thing the child picks up is language. The child does not pick up only language. The child picks up everything around the home. So those formative years is where the work is. Unfortunately, we lose time on those formative years. Unfortunately, we have not even started parenting those formative years. You know, a lady who was telling me that my husband would say they are still growing up now. Just leave them. They, uh, don't worry. When they are old, we'll deal with them. Forgetting they are there, they are being formed by the day. So for me, uh, what I would say is that we need to go back. Society needs to revisit this thing we call, we call child discipline. I don't believe in it. What I believe in is the culture of discipline. Where in the home, everybody understands that each of us have a role to play in the sanity of the home and in the sanity of society. And roles are not assigned. So daddy also can be disciplined. So mommy also can be disciplined. Children also can be disciplined. So the question is, how do we discipline daddy? How do we discipline mommy? How do we discipline children? So there has to be an agreement at the level of the family as to all of that is done. But this present reality of learning from the old, bringing old tradition into today, putting old wine in new wine skin, trying to raise children by dominating them, becoming domineering parents, you know, dominating children, beating them for, 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 for what they know nothing about, you know, it's, it's not working. It has not worked. It's not going to work. All right, let's look at children who have been victimized or abused because we're in a climate where um, children, by the virtue of their age, they can't sue or they can't be sued. Now, what kind of intervention is available for 
children who have been victimized, what that they can take advantage or of to seek help. What kind of intervention should be made available in the society so that children who are going through those things can seek help as at when needed? So let me say that children can sue. The state will sue on behalf of children. Uh, the, the child does not belong to the parents. The child belongs to the state. Parents are caretakers. So children are protected by the law. So if anybody abuses a child, the child may not be able to go to court for himself or herself. The government is going to go to court for the child. And so it is important that we, we, we take that out of the way. Um, so a child also can be sued, you know, depending on, you know, because if you if you look at the criminal justice in Nigeria, uh, you look at criminal justice visa visa it relates to children, you will realize that uh, children, you know, there's something called children in conflict with the law. Uh, age of criminal responsibility in Nigeria is not 18 years. I think age of criminal responsibility is seven years. Between seven and 12 years, you can be criminally responsible. So if a child commits a crime or does something that is contrary to the law, it, that child becomes a child in conflict with the law. And so and the law has made provisions of, for how that will be addressed. Nobody, human being, you know, living, once you cross the age of seven, between age seven and 12, can get away with anything, you know, running foul with the law. Having said that, so children... Uh, the, the custodians of the source of children is the Nigerian state. And that's why I keep saying there are four rings of protection. The first one is the family. Family is first, but family is not all. The second one is the community. You know, the community, in the community, you have the, you have the, you have the, you have the, you have the neighbor. In the community, you have the schools, you have religious places of worship. All of those people are in the community. Then you move from the community, you go to the state. That is the government. Making sure that there are laws that protect our children. Then from national government, you go to international community. You know, that is why the most ratified convention in the world today that protect the rights of children is the United Nations Convention. It's the most ratified human rights convention in the world. That convention was promulgated into law in Nigeria in 2003. That is what we domesticated as the Child Rights Act 2003, and which has now been domesticated in 30, like 30 states of the Federation. So the point, therefore, is that what we need to do, we need our children to understand that they must be their, their own whistleblower. If a child is experiencing any form of violence, it, the child has a responsibility to speak up. And we, as citizens, we must also understand that we are social police. Social policing simply means that if we have 200 million people in Nigeria, we don't have 200 million police officers. Uh, 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 so, so, and uh, the, the police officers in Nigeria are taken out of the 200 million, and they are not up to 100 million. So, which means police cannot be in at, at police is all omnipotent, is all mini science. It can't be at this, in the same place at the same time. Police needs me. Police needs you. Police needs me to report a neighbor who is perpetrating domestic violence against a child. The Lagos State Government, Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Agency, needs me to speak up. And that's why in Lagos since 2014, there is what we call mandatory reporter. Mandatory reporting law in Lagos State says that, if, if you are living in Lagos State, says that if you are aware that a child is being abused, you can report. As a matter of fact, you can even report anonymously. You can report anonymously, you know, to, to the government. And when you report anonymously, your one, you can call and tell the government your name and say, please, I want my name to be kept out of this. You can even call and shield your own name. All you need to do is to give all the facts that in my neighborhood, I'm hearing noise or cry from this particular room, from this particular house. It is number so, 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 so. I think if you move to the house, the, the, the room on the left, the room on the right, the flat upstairs or the flat downstairs, that's where the noise is coming from. There's this child who is always crying at about 12 midnight or early mornings and all of that. You can do, you can report all of that. It's also important that I note, you know, by way of, you know, a, by way of complete information. Do you know that in Lagos State, if you are aware that a child is being abused and you do not do anything about it, if it is found out that you are aware that a child is being abused and you do nothing about it, by your knowing and not doing anything about it, you have already flouted the law of Lagos State. And if you are arrested and prosecuted, such person will now be jailed for two years. Now, why would the person be jailed for two years? The person did not perpetrate the abuse. You know, the person was not the one who abused the child. But under the law, there are 
three levels of abu abusers when we when children are abused. The first one is the person who created the enabling environment for the abuse of children. The second person is the person who actually committed the offense. The third person is the person we call accessory after the fact, who is aware that a crime is being committed against the child, who is aware that a crime is being committed against the neighbor, and who keeps quiet. The legal state government now says that if you are aware that a child is being abused, a child, you know, under the executive order 2014, you know, mandatory reporting executive order, if you are aware that a child is being abused, abused in Lagos state and you do not speak up, and it is found out that that child has been abused. And it, in the course of investigation, it is found out that this adult is aware that a child has been abused and he or she says nothing. Such adult is going to be tried. If the adult is tried, the other adult is going to go to jail if convicted, you know, for two years. All right. So let's take it from there. Why do we have uh, cases of domestic violence underreported? You just talked about uh, the person who knows a child has been abused and refuses to speak about it being culpable as well so that happens not just for children but even for adults for the victims themselves some do not even report it now um, um femi talked about that we're having more cases now reported of men being abused by women but we do not have the actual statistics of men or women being abused because some of the victims will shy away from reporting why do we have this uh, situation well, um, there are many reasons why people don't report. Number one, they may think there's no help. You know, uh, reporting is one thing. Getting help is another thing. So um, if, if uh, salutes what the domestic and sexual violence response agency in Lagos State government, Lagos State is doing, domestic and sexual violence re response agency, salute what they are doing. Is that replicated in 36 states of the Federation? Now, uh, is that replicated? No. What is the disposition of government to respond? What are the available services? You know, uh, we are living in a country where most people are living in abject poverty. You know, everything has, uh, everything has skyrocketed. Inflation rate is off the roof and all of that. So people are dealing with a whole lot of, a whole lot of anger. You know, uh, people are angry with the state. People are angry with the government, but they can't go to Assault Rock. They cannot go to, um, they cannot meet out those anger against their focus. And so what do they do? They do transfer the aggression. Their wives, their spouses, their husbands, their children. And the people suffer all of that. So people already, people may not see light in the end of the tunnel for reporting. And again, that's number one. Number two is this cultural belief that, um, you know, um, I want to stay with my children. Uh, for example, for a woman, I want to stay with my children even if, if I've been abused because I'm staying because of my children. And I've always told women that, you see, the covenant of marriage is not superior to the covenant of living. As a matter of fact, it takes the living to be in a marriage or to be in a relationship, in an intimate relationship. So for me, ultimately, it is important that, you know, uh, women... And men alike understand that you cannot condone domestic violence. You cannot, you know, just refuse to speak up. You have to speak to someone. You have to find a way to make your voice heard. Now, there are many things that surround speaking up, though. There is, you know, for example, a woman is married to a man who has disabled the woman economically. The woman has nothing, has no access to anything. And the woman is going to domestic violence. Now, the woman is thinking that if I leave this man... How do I sort out myself? Where do I go from here? All of those issues need to be addressed. Uh, what kind of home do I go to? What kind of apartment? What kind of uh, facilities are available for me to go to? How do I continue to pay the school fees of my children? Because some of some men will threaten. If you go, just go with the children. Or if you go, you never see the children again. So all of these issues are things that answer to sensitization, answer to uh, provision of amenities, uh, provision of resources that those who speak up can lean on. So it's not enough to speak up. Some people, they speak up and they believe their case is worse off after they have spoken up. They are now wishing, they, 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 they wished they did not speak up because speaking up now, they are thrown out of that place which used to be a shelter. Now, there's nowhere to go. The children are not going to school. A lot is happening. So if people are going to speak up, it has to be an holistic package, a package that says you need to speak up. And when you speak up, these are the... These are the, pro, the, the, the provisions that we have made to cater for you 
as a response to the backlashes that you will suffer as a result of speaking up. So all of those have to be taken into consideration. Our culture, the culture of stigma. If a child is sexually molested, parents believe that they should not speak up. That's a type of domestic violence. Parents believe that they should not speak up. They believe that if they speak up, the child may not find a husband in future. And I keep saying that you are fighting for a future when you have not protected the presence. If my wristwatch is stolen, wristwatch is stolen, I'm allowed to go out there and say my wristwatch is stolen. No shame. If my ring is stolen, I'm allowed to go out there and say my ring is stolen. No shame. If my cap is stolen, I'm allowed to go out there and speak and say my cap is stolen. And when I report that my wristwatch is stolen, my cap is stolen, all of these things are stolen. Everybody sympathizes with me. They do not see me as the as as the 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 bad person. But when I say my sexuality is stolen, when I say a man who is supposedly my husband or a man who is or a woman who is supposedly my wife slaps me or beats me, society says I should be ashamed. I should be ashamed when my dignity of woman person is taken away, but I should not be ashamed when tangible things, things that are replaceable, you know, are taken away. So therefore, it's, a, it's an upside down thinking. We need to surmount and overcome that thinking and be able to come out and speak. But again, we have to also help people with support group. You know, when people speak up, they have to be support group where people can come together, have conversations, people that are going through the same thing, are able to say there's nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, we can come together, we can form a group, we can speak. And I think that at the level of domestic and sexual violence response agency in Lagos State, there's such support group. Apart from the fact that there are professionals working with those who speak up, there's also support group of people that are going through the same kind of experience coming together to share experiences, share ideas, share passion, share pain, share pleasure, and they're able to move together, you know, as um, uh, into what is their defined future, you know, as people who have suffered the same kind of, um, uh, the same kind of injustice uh, in the society.